Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for uh, joining me today for the webinar, uh, Data Breach and Investigation. Um, can I just ask those that are um, here, can you hear me? OK, if you could just quickly type in the uh, chat box whether or not you can hear me, that'd be fantastic. Fabulous. OK, we're going to kick off because I appreciate that you've all given me your precious lunchtime. Um, to talk. So you're all here to hopefully listen to what we can learn from um, data breaches that have occurred uh, in the past. Um, and I am joined today uh, by Piers Claydon from Claydon Law. Piers, would you like to uh, introduce yourself? Sure, yes. Good afternoon. And uh, thanks, Kelly, for having me on. And uh, good afternoon to everyone. Thanks for joining. Uh, yep, my, my name is Piers Claydon. Uh, I founded Claydon Law about 10 years ago as an IT tech law uh, 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 specialist practice, uh, but we also do an awful lot of um, data privacy compliance uh, advice for, um, for clients. So what we're going to do today is we're going to talk for some about some definitions because I think it's useful to set some context. We're going to talk about some of the con, uh, common threats from internal as well as external. We're going to talk about some um, big breaches that have happened that you will all likely be familiar with. We'll then touch on um, what we can learn, because that's why you're all here, we want to know what we can learn. We'll talk about um, notification, when you can and when you shouldn't. And then we'll talk about the rise of class actions and what we need to be mindful of. There will then be some time at the end for you to um, challenge us with some questions. Um, if you have none, that's fine. If you do, um, I would suggest that you start typing them in the box and we'll address them at the end. So without further ado, um, we're going to cover some um, definitions just to set a bit of uh, context. So um, we're going to talk a lot up today about data controllers and data processors. Um, it's useful for everybody on the webinar to understand what role they are playing. Um, so a data controller, it decides why, what the purpose is and how the means by which information is going to be collected and used. Um, and then a processor is someone that's doing a task on behalf of a data controller. Um, and for, we've got some examples like a payroll provider, um, external uh, cloud provider, shredding company. And from a data breach perspective, it's important that we understand the difference between a controller and a processor because there are different requirements from a breach notification perspective. Um, I don't know, Piers, if there's anything you'd like to add? Uh, no, just... Um... Yeah, I suspect uh, we are very much looking at this really from the controller perspective today, um, because the actual what the processor has to do is a fairly short and sweet uh, requirement. Um, so, uh, and whereas uh, as in a controller context, we're looking at you know, all sorts of um, uh, organisations, employers, e-commerce websites, membership organisations, anyone who holds uh, personal data in a way in which they have control over over how they're using it. Perfect. So we also want to define what is the security um, principle, and I'm going to uh, let talk, let talk, let <laughs> peers uh, cover this particular point. Thanks, thanks, Kelly. Um, so the GDPR uh, is fairly non-prescriptive, actually, in what it requires from organisations in relation to security. Um, we 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 put in there the, the 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 an extract from the wording, and you'll see that um, what's important is. Uh, looking at the state of the art of uh, information security and the sorts of risks that as a as an organization you are um, the sorts of data that you're handling and sorts of risks attached to that data so it's a, it's in a way your security requirement and how secure you have to keep keep the data will depend on a the data that you're handling uh, and processing and b uh, subjectively looking at you as an organization so uh, uh, the, the, the regulator will look differently at a very small, um, small charity organisation with not much funding against a much bigger organisation, a PLC, who has um, a much bigger budget for IT security. So, um, uh, and it will look askance at uh, bigger organisations who have uh, not adopted the most basic um, security um, uh, protections. Um, and uh, uh, so, so, and in fact, the bigger the, the bigger the organisation, I think you're held to a higher yardstick. In fact, uh, you know, the bigger your budget, 
you're expected to be a leader in security rather than just doing what everyone else does. And I think the, the point I'd like to draw out is the very last couple of sentences. It's about the appropriate technical and organisational measures. So it's not just about the, the technical components, but organisational measures such as clean desks, access to buildings uh, and whatnot, because there have been stories in the press about how people have gained access to a building because of a lack of um, security. So it's appropriateness of the security that's relevant to your business um, that I want to draw on. And just to add one other thing on this slide, Kelly, if I may, um, the, the, uh, when we're talking about breach of security uh, today, th we're talking about where your, the security you have in place has has been um, breached, whether that's internally, inadvertently, or externally by a malicious a malicious actor. Um, and and we'll we'll come on further to to what a little bit we'll draw a bit more on that later. So um, I think it's useful to touch on what are the most common threats. Now we're going to list some. I'd be uh, interested. Um, to know from anyone that's listening to the webinar if there are different threats that you may be aware of um, that we don't um, touch on because um, we've tried to be as um, cover as much as possible but for me there are a, a number of types of data breaches um, that can happen I think the most that you hear about in the press are those that are accessed by an unauthorized third party and we're thinking about the hacker uh, in this situation and they're the ones that kind of uh, grab the attention um, of the press although you do sometimes get uh, malicious um, intent from within an organization and we're going to use an example of that later on in the presentation where someone has deliberately made a decision uh, to access personal data um, whether you are the controller or you are the processor um, and you have breached um, personal data we have all seen emails that have gone to the wrong person you may never have sent an email to the wrong person um, and for that I'd be like you are very unique um, but you will definitely have received an email and then two minutes later the oops sorry I didn't mean to send that um, to you now if that email happens to contain a lot of personal information, like an Excel spreadsheet, for example, or you inadvertently disclose people's email addresses um, in the CC box, but the nature of your service is health related, so you could cause emotional distress, for example, you know, uh, a HIV clinic, putting everyone's email addresses in, you could infer that everybody is a patient at that clinic. Um, you could, still i mean how many times have you been on a train and you see people get up on the moving train to go to the bathroom and they leave their laptop uh on the uh, on the table or they get up at a coffee station uh to go fill up their coffee it doesn't take much for that laptop to get stolen or for you to lose it and i've had clients who tell me they've left laptops in the boot of their car and the car's been stolen or they've left laptops uh at an airport it happens um and obviously there's the loss of availability. And for me, I think the um, the most relevant recent example I can use for this is the uh, Travelex um, example. I don't know the real um, details behind what that incident is other than it's been indicated it's an external threat of ransomware. Um, but there has been a loss of access to that information for a significant period of time. So there is a breach. Thanks. and, and um... Uh, Kelly, and also probably worth just mentioning that um, s some of these high-profile cases, you may be feeling well, that that there that that'll, ne that'll never happen to us. In fact, um, a what's underlying a lot of these is just um, vulnerabilities in the system which could easily have been fixed and patched. And um, where those vulnerabilities have been known for some time, and an organisation has not taken steps to to address them. Um, that again, the regulator will not look kindly on that, and indeed, you know, uh, will come on to also the potential exposure you might have to individuals for those for those breaches later on. Conversely, it's also worth saying that you know, not all security breaches are going to amount to a breach of the GDPR, because um, assuming you have done everything that could reasonably have been expected to you, expected of you rather, and um, you are up to date with patching and maintenance of your systems uh, and your trainings up to speed, et cetera, et cetera. 
then then just because you had a scoop, it's just one of those things that happened. What's important is what you take away from it and how you how you learn from it. Um, and and that leads us on to the, the big point, which is um, many, 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 many more breaches are caused by um, unsophisticated um, actions by by humans, human error. It's by far the biggest cause yeah. of, uh, of uh, calls that we have. And I expect yeah. Kelly, you too. For sure. We are the weakest link. I know it sounds quite <laughs> harsh as a statement, but um, ultimately, even a hacker is a human um, at the moment until that becomes fully automated. So, um we need to understand that we can there can be technological threats, but actually humans are the vast majority of the issues, uh, unfortunately. I did also want to touch on um, examples of external um, threats. I'm sure some of you uh, may have experienced some of these. Um, certainly one that is very popular are what's referred to as phishing scams. So you get an email sent to your inbox. It looks genuine. Um, it's 20 years ago, it was someone from a different continent asking you to um, contact them because you were due £100 million from a will. Um, and a lot of people fell for um, that. Um, today, actually, they more look like invoices. And the spear phishing is the more targeted um, messaging where it looks like a genuine email. It's a genuine amount of money. It doesn't look unreasonable. Um, and people click the link and they pay the money. Um, and it they end up being out of pocket. Um, they are very common. The less common are the uh, things like denial of service because you typically they are larger companies that are being targeted with that and essentially it stops uh, internet traffic coming to your business. Um, malware where someone sent around a virus and you know the national cybersecurity um, are always given latest threats about um, what's up and coming and, and more deadly than the last. Hmm. Um, and I think the more one we hear a lot about, which scares people, is ransomware, because that's where someone's accessed your information and made it no longer available um, to you. Um, and that, again, is on the rise. Um, I think what I wanted to draw my your attention to is that 20 years ago, um, we didn't have, well, we had mobile phones, but they were very, very um, early stages. I mean, the most uh, complex thing you could probably do on a mobile phone was play Snake um, <laughs> on it. Whereas today, your mobile phone could become a big vulnerability to you as a business because a member of your staff has downloaded a free mobile app and that when it's connected to your network has then opened up a whole um, issue of security um, for your business um, so it is one to they are things to be mindful um, of so let's really dig into the meat of this webinar it's like what can we learn we've talked to you about the threats we've talked to you about human error um, but let's take four recent examples and we're going to go back a couple of years so some were pre-gdpr some are post so some actions are still to come um, and we're going to talk you through um, these uh, high profile um, breaches. So what we have is the pre GDPR. So um, Morrison's and we're going to talk about that um, in a little bit from both a class action perspective, um, as well as um, what we can learn from it. We've then got the um, the fine for Dixon's, which is the DGS retail group was this year it was January this year. But the actual incident happened just before the GDPR come into force, which is why the fine was only half a million, only half a million. Um, the other two are uh, British Airways and uh, Ticketmaster. Now, the key things I want to draw out about these is obviously these were high profile. They hit the press. They involved large volumes of customer information. Um, some involved credit cards, some in involved passport information. The Morrisons involved payroll information being put onto a website as well as being distributed to um, journalists. Um, the DGS was the fact that they just hadn't updated um, the software on their point of sale, um, which we've talked about. Ticketmaster was, you know, with the, the joy of technology today is plug and play. So they plugged something into um, their website, thought it was going to be really beneficial. Uh, actually, it um, involved malware being attached to that. So for a third party, they were um, had a massive uh, incident. There has been no 
enforcement notice at the moment because it takes time to for the information commissioner to investigate an incident um, before any action is taken, um, which is also the case um, with British Airways. It was a short period of time. Some of you may have been affected by this because it was over the summer period. Um, again, there's a class action element that I'm going to let Piers talk about. Um, but the key is that it was poor security protocols, both through the website <coughs> and through the mobile app, because today, obviously, there are different ways that you can book information. It's those vulnerabilities that led um, to information on customers being compromised. So there are four. If you want to see the, the sheer number of breaches that happen, uh, just Google data breaches and, and you'll be um, surprised. But Piers, mm. I know there are some points that you wanted to draw out particularly. Sure. Yeah, yeah, thanks, uh, Kelly. So so just on the Ticketmaster incident, um, th as as you say that we've had no uh, notification from the ICO other than the fact they are they are investigating but broadly uh, and i've heard this said a few times to me is that you know well the, the ICO isn't isn't finding anyone rather than any rather than high profile outfits they really haven't used the financial muscle they have under their under the gdpr to to, to take action that that is certainly true um that is not not to say that they're not doing anything and these things do take time um, the more important thing, I think, for for us, uh, uh, perhaps less hope, high profile uh, companies, is to take away the the sort the straws in the wind from their from their statements that they have been making about how they are going to address um, organisations which are found to be to be wanting on this on the security side of things. So, uh, just to give you an example of that, so Ticketmaster, I think we can expect to have a very hefty wrap over the knuckles. Um, not least because they were told two months before uh, the actual breach became public that um, that, that, that this uh, software they were using was vulnerable, and um, they've been told uh, by 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 one of the banks, Monza, um, and that that is not that's not a good look for for Ticketmaster, um, and you know time will tell you know, how 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 uh, how what what a dim view the ICO is going to is likely to take 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 at that. Um, and just to sort of draw that Kelly's mentioned a couple of time points, the um, point around uh, class action, which is a, a potentially big and growing issue for organizations. So just to explain what, what we mean by that, it is, it is the ability for groups of aggrieved um, individuals to club together, uh, helped, I'm afraid, by uh, lawyers who um, uh, you know, will, will take a cut of the damages awarded um, to um, bring action against these, in, in respect to these big data breaches against big, well-resourced um, data controllers. And um, we've always known this is a possibility under GDPR. It, it, it provides for it. W what's interesting from the UK point of view is that we are going towards a US-style um, group action regime, which is an opt-out rather than an opt-in one we're not there yet but uh, and, and what i mean by that is that it, uh, it is becoming much easier for lawyers to organize these group actions because they are not needing to show individual damage in every individual's case in the group they only have to show that a particular type of damage is likely to have been shared by multiple members of, of the group to be able to bring the claim and that's uh, a fairly recent development and i think um possibly shows the direction of travel um, here in the UK. So, uh, and why is it why is it important? If, if if fines don't worry you, then there is the possibility of, of data subject group actions, which which really should um, should be an issue and um, uh, one which one which is worth, worth bearing in mind. And I think the um, the point I quickly uh, want to cover before we move on to the next slide is that British Airways are continuing to be investigated by the Information Commissioner, but as Pierce said, because of the size of the company, they have quite a, a strong legal team that are defending their position, and the decision to find British Airways has been delay delayed because of that negotiation that is happening between the legal um, teams. But there are absolutely things that we can learn from these breaches that you can do and implement in your business because a breach is likely to happen. You're never gonna be 100% uh, risk-free 
of a data breach. So what steps can you put in place to reduce that risk? And that's what we're trying to do is reduce the risk of an incident um, and then being mindful of what action you need to take should an incident happen. So things such as network security, make sure that, you know, you regularly test um, your network. And if you're not responsible for that network because you're a small organization, how does your external IT team support you um, with that? Um, are you educating your staff on training and awareness? How do they know what a phishing scam email uh, looks like? Um, are they aware of the data protection policies that they have? Are they aware of um, what they can and cannot do in terms of check emails before you send them kind of thing? Um, do you have policies in place about removable media, for example? Some companies have locked down the USB ports because they refuse to accept that risk coming into the network. Some organizations will not allow mobile phones to be connected and plugged in um, to the laptop. Um, they'll connect it to a guest Wi-Fi, but not to the main because of the potential threats. Um, what about using or um, having appropriate user privileges? So making sure um, that the right people have the right level of access. One of the things that was uh, of interest with Morrison's was that the individual had a high level of access to very sensitive information, which he was then able to publish and send. So do you regularly review that? Um, and it sounds silly, but too many people have an administrator password of admin admin. So please, please don't have uh, that. If you do, please change it. Um, monitor the system do you ever kind of test your staff in terms of um activity that's going on um within the the systems would you know that a threat has happened so if we look at the Ticketmaster example if they were told two months before what were they doing how did they not know this was a vulnerability why did it take two months for them to be notified are they checking for vulnerabilities do they know that all the systems on their network are up to date not all of us push out updates to our staff some of organizations leave it to the staff to update their system so how are you monitoring it and what measures are you put in place in terms of preventing malware you know do you have antivirus software not just on computers you know, but do you have it at a network um, level? How are you preventing um, issues coming in um, to the uh, the business? And I know, Piers, that you had some points that you wanted to raise. Yeah, uh, just uh, on the IT side, um, you know, a very basic point, uh, but and, and perhaps a cliche, but prevention is better than cure here. So if you don't have personal data, there's nothing to hack and nothing to steal and no risk. So make sure your retention and deletion policies are up to date. You're not holding loads of historic data that is otherwise um, vulnerable to a, a potential breach. If you don't have it, it can't be, it can't be hacked. Um, think about encryption. Um, there's really no reason not to have devices being encrypted these days. I, I don't think there's a question around um, communication and encryption and communication and, 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 and the sort of usability of that. But certainly at a device level, that's something that, that should be uh, standard. Uh, making sure that uh, laptops can be remotely locked down and turned into bricks, or, or indeed mobile devices turned into bricks if need be, if they are if they're reported as missing, um, and just looking uh, uh, to, to, against the sort of access control side. Um, do does everyone need access to everyone's personal information, or c is it possible that uh, the marketing department can do their job without having uh, access to the entire? profile of every single uh, customer um, of the organization or can things be what's called pseudonymized which is basically tokened um, uh, and attributes attached which is doesn't in itself um, make it personal data um, and also just stepping away from the sort of the, the techie stuff don't forget the the the, the, the age-old um, offline stuff just physical issues around security um, and locking things up and clear desks and, and laptops being being locked away and that sort of thing. Cool. So we've got a couple of slides about learning, which we'll quickly um, whistle through because I'm conscious of uh, time. Um, you can learn from your near misses. Um, a breach is a, or from a GDPR perspective, a personal data breach is a breach of security leading to the accidental 
or unlawful destruction of personal data. I think that's the key thing we need to be mindful of. But if you do have a breach, understand what you should be doing um, in terms of notification, whether or not you're a processor having to tell the controller or whether you're the controller having to tell the information commissioner. The big thing is that most people report too late and they don't have complete um, incident um, reports. Um, and for me, I think the, you know, they can, data breaches can be very overwhelming. They can be, um, you get into a state of panic, um, but you can learn from these. So if you haven't had a breach, are there things that are in the press that you could share with your team to say, if this happened to us, this is what we'd want to do. So can you put simple things on team agenda meetings that says, you know, I just saw the Ticketmaster breach. You know, do we know if all of our systems are up to date? It's a simple question that could lead to um, reducing um, your risk. And just to add to that, uh, ha do have a look at your um, insurance uh, um, policies. And uh, we don't yet have a fully sort of uh, GDPR one-stop shop uh, insurance policy on the market. I suspect these things will come in due course, but between your cyber insurance and potentially your and other 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 liability insurance you might have, there is a chance that there will be some cover for you there, uh, helping you perhaps with um, remediation action, uh, you know, data checking, uh, credit checking, and, uh, and monitoring services for individuals um, and also defense costs for legal claims. Um, but what's really important and should be worked into your policy is that you know whether you have the insurance, A, and B, you, in, you inform your insurer as soon as possible. Yeah. Otherwise, they won't be in a position to help you. <laughs> um, so why um, does it really matter? Um, I think it's a, it's a good question. Um, and um, something I'm going to let Piers talk about, it's mm. not just about the fines. It's not about the fines, it, 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 and I think certainly uh, with the, you know, I suspect many of us on on this call, it's certainly not about the fines. What what's really important uh, is that um, you you do the uh, you, you are aware of the risks, uh, the other risks that are out there from a from a data protection breach, um, you know, damage to reputation, loss of business, uh, having to having to answer those difficult questions is a is a problem increased cost for the business so i've mentioned cost of remediation so having to um tell tell individuals who might have had their data uh hacked uh the, you know and paying for their credit checking service and and uh, identity theft uh, monitoring services that sort of thing that all costs a lot of money it takes up a lot of time it's a lot of management time it's a massive distraction and uh, I've, I've mentioned the, the threat of um, class actions. I will, if there's time, I think we just do, do have a couple of minutes just to talk a little bit about risk as well. So uh, under GDPR, if you do suffer a security breach, um, there is a requirement to notify the ICO and a potential requirement to notify individuals. And that both of those depend on the level of risk. Um, and what we don't yet have is any clear uh, yardstick about how one measures risk and we're talking here about risk of uh, negative consequences for individuals whether that's loss of loss of control of their data discrimination id theft damage to reputation emotional distress that sort of thing um but but there are some guidelines out there from the regulators that particularly the european one um uh, the edpb and again what's important from their point of view is you look at the type of data the volume of the data the sensitivity of the data, the recipient of the data. So if the recipient is at, it's doing an inadvertent disclosure to someone who um, is, a tr is trustworthy and you can uh, have a written paper trial that they've deleted the data when they received it from their systems, the chances are you can escape the need to notify the ICO because the risk is uh, highly, or, or in, if not entirely, mitigated. Um, and so... Uh, uh, and 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 there's also this requirement to to, to tell the uh, to tell individuals if there's a high risk to them as well. So there's potentially two requirements there. And then, but only if if you're a processor, you must only tell the controller. And I think that leads quite nicely on to the demonstrating your accountability because I think you need you all your staff within your organisation, regardless of how large or small you are, need to understand the role that they play in data protection. What you don't want is um, a member of staff inadvertently explaining 
that you know it, you've had a breach and everybody's affected so a customer phones up and you sadly say yes everybody's had a breach you know and you then become worried your reputation is already um, being challenged so train your staff I can't emphasize um, that enough you may need to have different training for different types of staff but also build a culture where if something does go wrong you are aware of that because what you don't want and I've, ex I've experienced this when I've been supporting clients where someone phones you up and says did you know this has happened and I've seen your information on the dark web or I saw this email go out with this information you want to be in control of the situation rather than the situation being in control mm. um, of you so it is half past that was quite a whistle stop uh tour of breaches so the question is now do you have questions um for us so um please use the um type box or the text box to type any questions um happy to answer ah okay so if a third party website is compromised and usernames and passwords are scraped and then used to access our business members details, how do we stand in terms of a data breach? Um, so I'm assuming uh, that, we, you, uh, Emily, you're, you're the uh, controller there. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I, I guess we've got to go through the steps. So, so has there been a breach of your security? Um, then you, on the face of it, very much so. Um, uh, and I guess it's then a question of. So, yes, there's been a data breach. Uh, if if there's been third party malicious a access to your members, and um, uh, the question therefore is, what is the risk to 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 those individuals, and yeah. and whether you need to. Uh, um, notify the ICO and all the individuals themselves and what steps they would take to, to remediate those. So I think the the, the, the key is, um, you know, there's been a breach, understand um, the volume of what has what has taken place, understand um, what is the, the actual impact on those individuals. Are you responsible for that data? So do you determine how it's used? So you're the controller, therefore it's your responsibility to report to the information commissioner if in this situation you are managing the system on behalf of um, a client, then you need to tell them it's happened because as a processor, that's your sole responsibility. Um, we've then got, um, ah, oh, this is a good, I love questions about retention, so I'm gonna get a little bit nerdy. <laughs> so to avoid breaches, what would be a realistic retention schedule for paper and electronic records? And I wish there was a simple answer for that, but the key thing is, do you know the different types of information you're collecting? So employee information, uh, client data, prospective clients and suppliers. And then the question for me would be, do you have legal requirements to hold on to some of that data? Um, so you, for an example is employment data you keep for up to six years after a member of staff has left because um, that's it, that is laid down in statute. Where there isn't something that's laid down, say, for example, prospective clients, my argument to you or my challenge to you is what is a reasonable length of time for you to hold that information? So if you know your sales cycle and it takes, say, two years to convert a prospect to a client, then keep the information for two years. The challenge then is how are your systems, whether they be um, electronic or otherwise, going to support you in reminding you that that retention period has occurred and you now need to delete that data? Um, so it's not a simple answer, but map your data and then identify what are the different retention uh, periods and build what we refer to as a retention schedule. If you have more questions, I'm happy to take that offline because mm. I could literally talk a long time it's, about it. It's that. a really big issue, isn't it? And and um, I, I think the, the the legal point around this is that you you must only keep information for as long as uh, you as the reason that you gave for keeping it. Uh, is if you sort of mean so you can't is that there's a purpose limitation if, if 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 the information has been used for its purpose and it doesn't isn't going to be used again you shouldn't have it yeah yeah and i think there have been too often the case where people have been challenged why you still why do you still have that information um and they they've not been clear because they don't have a policy um if we keep emails um in an email client um but it's on our asset register, how long should we keep them for? So the, the challenge with emails, and I think it's a really interesting one, is 
what's the purpose of the email? So if it's a client communication, then you may want to keep all client communications for the duration that they are a client of yours as a demonstration of your services and the audit trail. Um, when they're no longer a client, the question to you is how long is reasonable to hold that information? So could you get challenged after they've stopped being a client with you because you haven't delivered a service? So would they? Be, is that evidence for you to show what you've done? Mm. Um, you may set that out in your contracts. Um, with your client and say this is the retention period um, and if you don't I would consider um, thinking about that but again you may have emails that are about employees and they will have a different um, retention structure so it comes back to what is it that you're collecting why are you using it and how long do you need to um, keep it for but for me don't keep emails longer than is necessary and I think it comes back to that as long as is necessary uh, yeah, and, and just um, one other point, I guess, on that, Kelly, is that uh, you should be doing whatever you said you're going to do on your in your privacy policy, in yeah. your public-facing documents. So um, you do need to sort of uh, uh, walk the walk and talk the talk yeah. on that in that respect. Um, mm -hmm. You shouldn't be saying one thing and not and totally ignoring it uh, back, back at base. Yeah, and I think the other thing I think to be mindful of is that and when we move from one system to an old system, people, in my experience, typically forget about the archived old database and it will be sitting somewhere. Um, and it's only when it could have been breached that you like, oh, I didn't even realize we still had that system. Mm -hmm. So it's not just about current systems. Um, it's think about the old ones. Think about well, not just paper, not just electronic, think about paper. If you've archived paper, is the archiving company shredding the paper in line with the retention schedules that you've given them to do? Because what you don't want to find is old paper records with client bank details, credit card information sitting in a filing cabinet in a remote office um, that you assumed had been shredded. Mm. Uh, and it does happen. Um, so I'm going to see if we've got any other um, questions. Um, so, okay, so the question we now have is, are there standard items to take into account in a risk assessment for notification um, in addition to the volume of the incident? So for me, I think the, the thing you need to think about is the impact on the individual. So that's what the information commissioner is interested in is, is the impact. So could you have caused emotional, financial, physical distress to an individual because of this breach? If the answer to that is yes, then my instance would be to report that to the information commissioner. If you haven't been able to prevent it, it really is about doing that immediate assessment. So if you've, um, and this is an extreme example, but I know it's happened, you've inadvertently disclosed an address of um, a spouse to another, to the other partner, um, and there is a risk of violence or a risk of abuse, you have to be aware of that. You've caused that level of emotional and physical distress. And for me, I would take that more seriously than sending an, an email address list uh, in CC rather than the BCC box. So for me, I think the most important impact is the impact on the individual. What would you say? Yeah, and just picking up on the question, the final part there, impact on the individual, uh, and do we have to talk about the state of our IT system? I think in the... In the notification, um, uh, I, I don't, I don't think you'd be setting out the, your full IT security policy. Um, what's important from the notification point of view is you're saying to the ICO, um, "This is this is what's happened, and this is what we're doing about it. This is how we're trying to remediate it," um, rather than giving a giving. A, and, and you wouldn't indeed want to tell the ICO at this stage. You know, perhaps that it's not as well maintained all his patches as it as it as it as it could and should be i i, I the interesting point can i just wait one other uh, issue kelly on the um the, the what you say um and and how you engage um so for example lots of organizations will um need to engage in the event of a, a bigger data breach to the extent they can't find it out themselves they might want to engage an external um, provider to come in and do a forensic report mm -hmm. on what's happened um now uh, unless that goes through some sort of legal represent representative, whether it's an in-house solicitor or an external solicitor, that report will be potentially discoverable 
by anyone bringing an action against the, the the controller. And what I mean by discovery is that they, they are entitled, when they start the claim, to ask for any information around this uh, breach that, that you may have within your control. And that report would be made public and would be capable of being used by them in their own claim. So it's really important, if this whatever's happened to you, that um, you try to get those sorts of external reports governed by what's called legal privilege, which means it would then fall outside of um, the ability for the claimant to, to see it. Good because the chances are it will say things that are not particularly helpful for you. Okay, so the, the next question is is really good, actually. If we have minor breaches, inadvertently disclosing email addresses and decide not to report them, do we need to record them somewhere? I would absolutely say yes, because what you want to do as a company is you want to know if there's a particular training need. So is it the same individual that is repeatedly sending um, emails to the wrong people? Or is it actually a much more wider issue in that the staff are not aware of how to handle that or the checks that they could put in place? So I always like to have um, an internal data breach register, which looks at the types of minor human error because if you can get on top of that you may prevent something a little bit more significant mm. happening so and you can discuss those at team meetings without naming and shaming anybody you can say you know did you know that in the last month we had this many emails go to the wrong person mm. i just want to take a minute to remind you take a minute before you send the email you know make sure it's going to the right person um, or you may even decide to put in a measure that your um, email system delays sending out the email to prevent that oops i'm sorry i've said it to the wrong person so i would record every breach that you have and use it as a learning opportunity i, I, I totally agree in fact it's, it's actually a requirement under the gpr to have a, a a register of breaches whether it was a notifiable breach or not and not only that it helps go to the wider accountability yeah. uh picture of, of you as an organization showing that you are um what you're doing to kind of live up to the requirements of the gdpr having a paper trail. It's all about having a paper trail. Excellent. Okay. Okay. So I think that's the main bulk of the questions. If there are any more that are coming out, um, we may have one more minute to respond to them. Um, I just wanted to take um, uh, a time. So before I talk about our services and peers' uh, services, um, there's a quick question that's come in. If you are a data processor, uh, do you have to report every single breach to the controller? That's interesting. Well, um, uh, I mean, the, the law <laughs> says yes. So the, the 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 processor has no discretion about this at all. That it's not a risk issue. It's not a. No, it's not a. It's no. There's no. There's no ability to take a view on that. The the the, the requirement on the GDPR is clear that if you have a have a security of, uh, event happening to you as a processor, then that has to go to the controller. Because then it's up to the controller to determine whether or not they need to um, notify. If you want a checklist on um, what can be notified. The Information Commissioner does have useful checklists on the website um, for you to have and the typical types of questions um, that may be asked of you um, when you are notifying that. So um, I'm mindful that we're almost at a, um, an end of the session. So I just wanted to briefly touch on, um, we offer obviously data protection services, training, audits, policy writing, data mapping, things such as this in terms of webinars and, and free blogs. Um, if you're interested, you know where to find us. Um, we've then got my contact details. Hopefully the slide is gonna light, uh, load. So my contact details in terms of email addresses and our social media um, profile. You'd had something from me because of the webinar. Um, I'm gonna let Piers talk briefly about his business and then I'll um, uh, bring it to oh, I, I, Yeah, thanks Kelly. I mean, it, um, so, really all the things that we've been talking about today around data protection we can assist on whether you, to work out whether you're a data controller or a processor that's not always clear um whether you should be notifying the ico or not uh yeah we've been helping a lot of clients with that over the last uh, few months uh under quite tight uh tight time constraints because the, the the time limits um and and uh, going forward, we can obviously help with um, you know, discussions with the ICO. Um, and we have a newsletter, which uh, a fairly regular newsletter, which uh, you may find helpful. So please do get in touch. So my final ask of anybody that's on the webinar, if any of you would like to have a 15 minute follow up call um, with me or with peers, if you could use the text box to type yes, 
um, I will make sure that you get a follow up. There's absolutely no obligation um, for you to um, give us a yes. Um, I would um, say thank you to everybody um, that has uh, joined um, the webinar. Your participation in the questions has been awesome. Um, thank you. Um, the webinar is being recorded. You will get a copy of that recording um, next week. So if there's anything that you've missed or we were talking a little fast that you want to pause, you'll get that opportunity. Um, and the next webinar I'm doing is next month is how do you manage staff leaving the business in a, day, in a way that is compliant with the uh, GDPR? So if you're interested in that, an email notification will go out next week. So it's 12.45. Thank you all very much. Um, for your attention this lunchtime. Thank you, Piers, for being part of the webinar. Um, I'll draw that to a close. Thank you, everyone, for attending and uh, have a great day. Thanks, Kelly. Thanks, everyone. And just uh, 